year. On the final day of the conference, we sat in little breakout groups on the lawn in front of Lake Geneva to discuss the future of martial arts studies and its intersections with contemporary issues. In a conversation about power and nationalism, Ben Judkins, musing on international conflict, the Russian invasion of Ukraine was still daily news at this point, asked, would anyone take up Sambo, the Russian national martial art, right now? The implication of taking up a distinctly national art of a nation actively practicing imperialist warfare, the group seemed to feel, was at the very least ethically gray. I sat there as one of the few, possibly only, conference attendees who identified my primary style of practice as distinctly Japanese karate. Confronted with the fact that, while probably all modern martial arts have nationalist origins, Shotokan Karate Do emerged as an explicitly nationalist project of an explicitly fascist regime. And so this paper was born. Today, I'm going to argue that beyond the obviously fascist aesthetics of Shotokan, the bodily practices of karate train the habitus in fascism. I'll begin with a brief discussion of fascism and fascist aesthetics, consider a history of Shotokan's fascist origins, and then turn to an investigation of particular stances and movements to get at the deeply embedded, embodied practices of fascism within karate. I will conclude by thinking about the question that haunts me still. What does it mean to cultivate a body through explicitly fascist practices? And, if there are virtues and values to Shotokan beyond fascism, which I hope there are, how, if at all, can we extract them from their fascist contexts? While the stakes of fighting fascism are relatively self-evident, I'll take a moment to discuss specifically how early 20th century Showa fascism depended on the cultivation of an aesthetic of violence, both killing and suicide. In her essay on fascist aesthetics of Nazi film, Susan Sontag writes, Fascist aesthetics flow from and justify a preoccupation with situations of control, submissive behavior, extravagant effort, and the endurance of pain. They endorse two seemingly opposite states, egomania and servitude. The merging of what Tansman describes as destruction and creation, self-sacrifice and self-aggrandizement, is true of Shoah fascism as well, often imagined through death. While Nazi imagery fetishized death through powerful Teutonic warriors, for example the SS Death's Head Crest, Showa fascism fetishized death through imagery of the lone soldier who dies on the battlefield for the emperor to be mourned by his family at home. In Showa fascism, death and violence become beautiful. Submission and stillness are wrapped up in power and destruction. Fascism here explicitly deploys biopower to entangle one's death with the rebirth of the state. In his 17 March 1976 lecture, Michel Foucault argued that fascism brings together this paradoxical biopower for killing. For the state to live, the other must die, and you must kill them. And in Showa fascism, you must die as well for the state to be reborn. This entanglement produces what he calls a racist state, a murderous state, and a suicidal state. Critically, as philosophers like Donovan Schaefer have argued, the basis for these beliefs begins with the way things feel, clustered material forms, aspects of our embodied life, and how our bodies encounter other bodies. Lauren Griffith's work, particularly her recent Graceful Resistance, makes a compelling case for the way that bodily practice shapes one's affective habitus, or the underlying emotional orientation toward the world that one acquires through engagement with a particular social field. For the martial artist, and for anyone, this affective habitus is inextricable from the bodily habitus inculcated through bodily practices. When we run this back through Schaefer, we arrive at the sense that what we might mislabel as belief or politics, both of which sound entirely too rational, are in fact a product of one's bodily and affective conditioning. My own work brings these together to argue that ethics really has to do with the cultivation of these habits, that ethical thinking is about recognizing and revising non-conscious, embodied, affective responses toward acknowledgement and celebration of what bodies can do. But fascism is the opposite of this. It inculcates bodily habits of death, of murder, and suicide. Griffith's work celebrates the potential of a cultivated affective habitus to liberate and resist oppression. I am suggesting that the beautiful, contemplative, self-perfecting affective habitus of Shotokan Karate may in fact at least historically have done quite the opposite. The cultural history of Shotokan Karate Do is inextricably connected to the Meiji Restoration and the rise of fascism in early 20th century Showa Japan.
Funakoshi Gichin, the founder of Shotokan, was born in 1868 in Ryukyu, which is now Okinawa, and trained under Anko Itosu and Anko Azato. But what we call the style he learned from them is part of the explicitly nationalist project behind karate. In a letter to the Secretary of Education, Anko Itosu referred to his style as Tengte, or Chinese Hand. As the Ryukyu styles began to make their way to Japan, the idea that the martial art was Chinese could not stand, and so they were renamed based on their regions. Anko's style became Shurite after the Shuri prefecture where he lived. And when Funakoshi brought the style to mainland Japan in 1936, he changed the characters to Karate, or Empty Hand. Shotokan literally means House of Shoto, which is Funakoshi's pen name. So even the name, and how we refer to Shotokan and its antecedents, indicates a particular point along the nationalist endeavor. Along the way to Shotokan, we can see the introduction of explicitly fascist aesthetics. Most of these are well-researched or even self-evident, but they give us a useful jumping-off point. Perhaps the most obvious are the hierarchies of belts introduced to Judo by Kano Jikoro, the veneration of founders and teachers with images of the shomen or front of the dojo, and the emphasis on Bushido, or a resurrected samurai spirit. These are useful because there are clear other explanations for these elements. Belts help teachers distinguish between beginning and advanced students at a glance while teaching, and give external motivation to students. The veneration of founders and ancestors makes some sense in the religious context of Shinto and Buddhism, though the veneration of ancestors and the emperor as a core part of Japanese culture is arguably part of the Meiji Restoration's revision of history and Buddhism. These examples, rank belts in particular, set up a framework that I will call back to in the later analysis of embodied practice, elements that have, on the one hand, a seemingly obvious and innocuous cause, and that are, at the same time, collectively, part of the fascist project. Bushido offers a clear example of something that seems reasonable. We are talking about martial arts, so some connection to martial culture makes sense. However, Inazo Nitobe's Bushido, The Soul of Japan, brought Bushido into cultural prominence, and it was published in 1899. Even more importantly, it was published in English a year later as an extension of soft power to make a case for Meiji Japan's entry onto the world stage through Nihon Jinron, or the purported uniqueness of the Japanese, as Scharf argues. Bushido, broadly understood, was cultivated through martial arts, wrestling, archery, swordsmanship, etc., at the Dai Nippon Butokukai, headed by Kano Jigoro, the founder of Judo. And even the names of these martial arts reflected an ideological project, as Nishikobu Hiromichi transformed these arts from jutsu, or techniques, to do, or ways, to show that martial arts taught service to the emperor, not technical skill. For more on that transformation, uh, Abe, Kiyohara, and Nakajima offer a thorough and complex history of how school gymnastics in Japan gradually became increasingly militarized throughout the early 20th century. Any one of these elements by themselves is not necessarily fascist, though we should definitely consider that all martial arts will to some degree be militaristic and bring with them the associated problematics of violence and depersonalization. But, as Anko's letters and Funakoshi's writings show, they saw this as part of an educational and shaping project. Itosu wrote that if children began to practice Tengtei when they are young, that they would be well-suited for military service. Funakoshi Gichin writes that the ultimate aim of karate is perfection of character. And these two together articulate how Shotokan cultivates the fascist habitus, aesthetics. Karate is beautiful and aesthetic, and deliberately so. Militaristic perfection is literally embodied in the incessant practice of physical refinement and conformity. A karate class will likely spend most of its time repeating the same movement, aiming for every muscle and motion to be exactly, precisely the same in every execution across every body. Bodily differences are made to submit. There is a right way to perform this strike in the kata, and it's always this way. Unlike the more obviously violent, arguably fascist overtones in some contemporary practices, I'm thinking of last year's presentations from Sven Korner on uh, Krav Maga and Mario Stoller's research on police and military combatives, Shotokan seems almost the opposite, contemplative and aesthetic. And this, I argue, is what makes it distinctly Showa fascist. To think critically about how aesthetics primes bodies for fascism, I turn to the phenomenology of embodiment, how it feels to cultivate the bodily habits of Shotokan, particularly those elements which may well be the inculcation of fascist aesthetics. By exploring how Funakoshi Gichin and his son, Funakoshi Gigo, altered Tengtei or Shurite as they introduced it to mainland Japan, 
I will demonstrate that there is a strong argument to be made for Shotokan Karate Do as a fascist, body shaping enterprise. Like the rank belts, karate's famous kata seem innocuous and pragmatic, but in context they may help cultivate that fascist aesthetic. They make it simple to learn a whole set of techniques, and they're not unique to Showa era martial arts. But on the other hand, Sontag emphasizes how the rendering of movement in grandiose and rigid patterns lies at the core of all fascist aesthetics. To think about kata, let's start with stances unique to Shotokan. Bukutstach. Here's an image of Funukoshi Gichin performing a movement from a beginner kata in Kokutstach in 1925. And here's his son, Funukoshi Gigo, doing a similar movement only a few years later. Notice the difference in the height of their stances. Phenomenologically speaking, to take Gigo's stance feels powerful. And importantly, you can see it on his face. Faciality, in a Deleuzian sense, is the site where the territorializing, meaning-making, signifying regime of signs collides with the deterritorializing, post-signifying, subjectifying regime. In other words, Gigo's face is both a sign and not a sign, the communication of a meaning-making intensity and the post-meaning expression of the body's affects that have no direct meaning. As Jenny Edkins writes in Face Politics, the face exists in a particular cultural, geographical, and historical context as a product of a certain assemblage of power, a certain politics. This face says, look at the strength of this stance. Look at the power that I can barely contain. Gigo's face and Kokutstach are the intersection of two Shotokan concepts, kime, or the kind of explosive stopping movement indicative of Shotokan, and an unnamed kind of readiness that I'm going to call Ansoka Jontai, or a state of repose, after the cultural criticism of Isoda Komichi. In Shotokan, kime replaces the principle called Chinkuchi or Kimochi in Okinawan arts, which is more of a loose, whipping release that does not fix, which is the meaning of kime, does not fix a body in space. In Shotokan, this becomes what we see in Gigo's face and body, a tension at the end of a movement, where everything locks into place. At the same time, this locking emphasizes the sudden cessation of movement in preparation for the next burst of motion. This resonates with what Isoda Kimichi calls Ansoka Jontai, a fascist aesthetic unique to Japanese fascism. In his Aesthetics of Japanese Fascism, Tansman describes it as a calm, cocooning respite from modern life but a cocoon that would eventually bear new and unanticipated forms of agitation. Compared to his father's more relaxed stance and face, indicative of the pre manchurian incident fascist repose, Gigo's stance feels like it is shoring up in preparation to erupt. I return here to my claim that these are aesthetic and phenomenological shifts. This has nothing to do with martial efficacy. Kime feels strong. The tensing of the muscles and sharp exhalation sends biofeedback through the body that says, I am powerful. The clenched fists and taut tendons of Gigo's forearms say, I am still, but I'll break from this stillness soon. The studied stillness, coupled with the rigid homogenization of this movement across bodies, this is always how the second movement of Gojishi Osho should look, is a self-annihilation that gives birth to the social. I stop moving so that I can explode into violence. I annihilate my bodily difference so that I can become karate. We can see these twin principles of violent stasis play out in the modification of kata as they move from Ryukyu into the fascist empire. It's rather difficult to trace clear histories of various karate kata for all the reasons one would expect. Myth has accreted around any and all the various masters. Records are lost, anecdotal, or just non-existent. The kata that I want to look at here is Gojushio Sho, which probably comes from Soka Matsumura in the 19th century as Useishi and comes to Shotokan through some of Funakoshi's students who trained with Mabuni Kenwa in the 1930s, either when he was in Osaka or, more likely, when he joined the Butokukai in 1935. Unfortunately, since we don't really have video recordings of any of these people, I've done my best to find what the communities say are excellent renditions of these kata, though we should acknowledge that they have certainly changed from how they would have been performed in 1930s Japan. In this first video, we see a very old version of this kata. Note the kind of whipping shake of Kimochi, the rolling shoulders as he flows through sequences. He pauses between moves to change stances, but those transitions are relatively smooth, and the stance is relatively natural. Contrast this with the more angular motions of the kata as it would likely have appeared in the 1930s. Note the deliberate slowness and stillness, 
the faciality, the potential to explode, and then to fix again. Now, I'm absolutely not saying Luca Valdesi is a fascist, but the changes in the kata almost certainly reflect the fascist aesthetic as it ramped up through the early 20th century into the 1930s. So what do we do with all this? If I recall correctly, after the conversation on the lawn last year, I said to Lauren, half-joking, maybe I need to stop practicing Shotokan and switch to capoeira. I didn't, though I did start training in MMA, which somehow feels like a lateral move. It feels easy to dismiss this entire paper as Foucauldian paranoia that sees fascist states behind every practice. None of my karate sensei have been Showa nationalists, many of them have been deeply caring, kind people. But Meiji restoration martial arts became Showa martial arts, became a way to train soldiers for massacres across China, Korea, the Philippines, and more, and to align a generation of bodies with an aesthetic way to kill and to die. Probably, nobody has ever been killed by moves 4 through 7 of Goju Shiho Sho, but certainly people were killed by bodies prepared to murder by the aesthetic of karate. I'd like to end this paper with something definitive, but I think studied ambivalence might be the best I can offer here. There's no sense in arguing that we should go back to original Okinawan karate or even Tang Tei, since this impulse to seek purity from modern corruption, as Paul Bowman argued last year, falls into the anthropotechnics of merely warding off modernity through the particularly modern rejection of modernism, in this case, fascism. Here, perhaps, martial arts studies' unique intersection of practitioner and academic can offer vague direction. At the last tournament where I performed kata, I took second place. One of the judges told me, You would have won if your face had been, I don't know, more intense, more violent. You looked too peaceful. Maybe this is the right direction? Perhaps a way to practice Shotokan karate without practicing fascism requires reevaluation of its aesthetics. Maybe no rank belts, room for bodily difference in technique, careful consideration of the kinds of violence one imagines in kata and why. If ethics celebrates acknowledgement and what bodies can do, then perhaps we must imagine what karate would look like if it were celebratory and built on interpersonal partnership. <laughs>